My name's Rachel Muirs. I teach theology at the University of Edinburgh, and it's my privilege and pleasure to chair the next session, which is a panel session on reading after Fry. And we have a very distinguished panel, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Um, in the interest of gentle mutual accountability, I will tell the whole audience that the panel have been asked to speak for approximately 10 minutes each. Um, <laughs> And we'll aim to have a little bit of discussion between the panel after that um, and try to make a good amount of time for questions from the audience. I'm going to introduce the whole panel now just so that we, 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 we've, we've heard that. Um, I feel like I could say that all of our guests need no introduction, but that, that would be a bit lazy, so I'll do a mini one. Um, uh, Professor Kendall Sulan is Professor of Systematic Theology at Candler School of Theology. Um, he's the author of many books, including most recently, very, very recently, Irrevocable, The Name of God and the Unity of the Christian Bible, which is available not only from all good books, bookshops, but also in a display copy on the tables right here. Um, so please do go and look at it. Um, Professor Ellen Davis is... Um, Amos Reagan Kearns, did I say that right? Amos Reagan Kearns, Distinguished Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke. And she's the author also of many books, and most re including most recently, Opening Israel's Scripture, um, a theological reading of the Old Testament. Um, Drew Collins certainly needs no introduction to all of us who um, are very appreciative of his work in together with Ben Fulford in bringing us all here. Um, but for the purpose of this panel, um, he is Associate Research Scholar at Yale Divinity School, and he is, his book is um, The Unique and Universal Christ, Refiguring the Theology of Religions, um, which you will find a, a small flyer about in your, in your conference pack. And um, David Ford, as we heard this morning, is Regis Professor of Divinity Emeritus at the University of Cambridge, and the author most recently of a commentary on the Gospel of John, about which I'm sure we will hear more <laughs> in due course. Um, friends, let's welcome our panel. And we're going to hear first from Kendall Sulen. And those of you who have the conference um, uh, folder, there is a handout in there which you may wish to, to consult. Kendall, please. Yes, thank you so much uh, to Drew and to Ben for this wonderful conference to uh, memorialize Hans Frey. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, I am going to ask you to look through your papers, and if you can, pull out this, because in order to maintain 10 minutes, I'm going to need you to do work with your <laughs> handout. Um, I personally am very glad that Hans did not drop presence from his book, Identity of Jesus Christ. I think the uh, idea of um, prioritizing identity to presence is a very useful concept. It was very formative in my own theological imagination and development. And I think it's a theme that we can trace through a number of his commitments. Um, so I've got a little box here at the beginning that I try to chart some of the ways in which identity precedes and shapes presence. So I think a fundamental commitment for Fry is uh, low-level hermeneutics. It's simply the claim that the plain sense of scripture is adequate to the spirit's internal witness. And that's a very fundamental claim for Fry. And in fact, I think it's in some ways the most fundamental uh, of his hermeneutical claims. Um, that has a literary uh, repercussion in the case of realistic narrative. And when I first read um, the identity book, you know, I was so proud of myself because I could recognize that it had a version of Anselm's ontological argument in it. And I remember going to Hans and saying, isn't, isn't that Anselm's ontological argument? Jesus lives as the one who cannot not live? And he said, oh, yeah, that's in there. Um, but of course, he doesn't mention Anselm. Uh, what, and that's a clue, too, because his real commitment is that what he's doing is simply explicating the plain sense of the Scripture. So we get that in, his, uh, in the final pages. I think this is about page 147, 148 of the Identity in the Weapenstock edition. 
And it's a, his comment on the verses, Luke 24, 6 and 7. Uh, why do you seek, seek the living among the dead is not adding anything to who we've already learned Jesus is. He's the one who uh, is already described as the one who must be handed over, crucified, and raised. So I was reading Identity a few weeks ago for a class and uh, came to this section and realized to my delight that, no, he doesn't mention Anselm, but at this climactic part of identity, what he does connect his argument to is the burning bush. God's revelation to Moses at the burning bush. Yes, it's there, page 148. And uh, actually, the, if the fundamental theolo hermeneutical claim concerns uh, plain sense of Scripture and the Spirit's internal witness, the fundamental theological claim is about God's identity as the God of Israel. And it's the priority of God's identity as uh, declared in Exodus 3.15. 3.15 is the key verse where God actually enunciates the Tetragrammaton and identifies God's self as the God of the fathers. Exodus 3.14 is the one that Christians always pay attention to, though. That's I am who and I am, and that's the one we love. But we prioritize presence at the expense of identity. We overlook the tetragrammaton. Well, as it happens, Fry in that particular passage also doesn't draw as much attention as he might to the actual content of God's name revelation in 3.15, Exodus 3.15. So that's where I have done, uh, have, have found myself reading after Fry. And um, so just to give you some hints of where that's taken my own research, uh, I'm at the bottom of this first page, as Christianity moved progressively away from a Hebrew or Aramaic linguistic background onto Gentile soil, the Tetragrammaton was increasingly eclipsed. Now, the Tetragrammaton is an opaque personal proper name. It's not I am who I am. It's the name that in Jewish tradition is tr traditionally not pronounced. We can say, I am who I am at any time. The Tetragrammaton, in contrast, is simply not pronounced liturgically. Well, uh, Jews of the first, second, uh, second temple period didn't pronounce it. It saturates the New Testament, but it's not pronounced. So uh, this is the observation of a German scholar. The New Testament is practically saturated with Jewish reticence before the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, Judas Shoshoi, for den Mammon Gottes without exegetes to date having noticed. Yes, that's correct. Um, and that's the eclipse of the divine name, specifically in the New Testament. So uh, an example of that on the next page is uh, Milton. Milton reflects our common intuitions about the New Testament. If that name, the Tetragrammaton, be so acceptable to God that he has always chosen to consider it as sacred and peculiar to himself, why has he uniformly disused it? If any name, whatever, can be so pleasing to God, why has he exhibited himself to us in the gospel without any proper name at all? That's the sound of good English common sense. Um, but the fact is, what it's overlooking is the fact that the name's being referred to obliquely. And so that's what we see in Mark 14. The high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? The blessed is simply a uh, stand-in surrogate word for the divine name. Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power. That's another surrogate. Uh, they know exactly what they're talking about. They're talking, uh, they agree on God's identity as the bearer of the divine name. They agree on the mode of indicating the name by uh, use of oblique reference. Um, well, so... Deeply important to the, to the texture of the New Testament identifies the God that Jesus prays to, and yet it's routinely blended out by translation. So uh, here are some examples. I've got, I don't know, how am I doing on my 10 minutes? You, you're doing great. You've had about six. So. Okay, good. All right, so four minutes is enough to cover a few. So two nouns in regimen, uh, according to the canon of Apollonius, uh, should both have the article or both lack it. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, ta rema tu kuriu. So we see two articles, two nouns. An exception occurs when the second noun is a proper name. If kurios is functioning as a surrogate for the divine name, you don't find the second article. 
Well, in all many key occasions, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of Lord. It's not the prepare the way of the Lord, it's prepare the way of Lord. Because, and it works in English too, you can hear the is necessary if it's a title. The is not necessary if it's a proper name. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Lord. Uh, everyone who calls on the name of Lord. So we've been habituated to hear as a title what in fact is a surrogate for the divine name. Um, it, the single most characteristic feature of Jesus' idiolect is his extremely eccentric use of the word amen. It's completely without parallel in ancient literature. Jesus enforces what he's saying by saying amen, amen. It's not non-responsorial use of amen. It's uh, blended out by virtually every translation. Um, and we come up with things like truly. Well, why is Jesus saying amen? Well, he's, he is using it according to Gustav Dahlmann, uh, writing uh, at, at the beginning of the previous century in the 1900s. Um, against the Aramaic background, Jesus' opposition to oaths. Oaths are frequently ways in which the divine name is in, invoked obliquely. Jesus doesn't like it uh, because it's a way of manipulating the divine name. He says, don't use oaths. Well, if he's not going to use an oath, what's he going to do instead? And so amen, just like his use of the divine passive, is a kind of a ripple effect of his own hyper-scrupulous uh, reserve before the divine name. Um, a final example that is particularly poignant because it would be so easy to correct this. Revelation 1.4, everybody's uh, familiar with grace and peace to you, from him who is and who was and who is to come, except that that's not what John writes. That's good grammar. John doesn't write good grammar. In this instance, he writes grace and peace to you from he who is and who was and who is to come deliberately not using the genitive case, forcing it into the nominative case because now he who is is functioning like a proper name, a, a Hebrew proper name which is not, um, doesn't, is not case sensitive. So Greek, which is case sensitive, is being forced to function in a non-case sensitive way in order to signal this is a surrogate for the divine name. Um, so to revisit Hans Frey's thesis, uh, the central theological claim that undergirds, uh, I think, his project, although that it's not explicitly enunciated, is that the reference to God as Lord, the bearer of the divine name, the God of Israel's fathers, does not add something to his being I am. Rather, uh, for him to be and to be the specific one are the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kendall. Um, and a special thank you for being so careful about the timing, but um, also for this immensely rich um, paper. Friends, I'm, I'm asking you to hold your questions because we're hoping that the conversation will emerge as the panel um, progresses. So we'll, we'll do all the audience questions at the end. I'll now invite Ellen Davis to present. And the paper, I see it. The paper is entitled Stretching the Literal Sense in the Pulpit. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I may take 12 minutes, but I promise I'll stop. I am a biblical scholar who preaches, and it is along that line of interest and practice that I respond to the work of my teacher. The eclipse of the biblical narrative that touches me most closely is the one that occurred in the Protestant pulpits of England in the 17th century, and in my judgment, continues to have substantial influence on preaching in Anglican and perhaps other Protestant traditions. Here I briefly consider the eclipse of the narrated and narratable world of scripture through the contrasting practices of two 17th century preachers, each in his generation widely regarded as the most stellar preacher of the age. The first is the poet John Donne, Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, and the second, John Tillotson, also Dean of St. Paul's, 
and later, Arch and later Dean and Archbishop of Canterbury. Their lives were chronologically contiguous, overlapping by a few months before Dunn died in March 1631. But as preachers and interpreters of the Christian life, they inhabit two entirely different intellectual worlds. Dunn is a relentlessly exegetical and evangelical preacher. Every advance and turn in his argument is made through the gradual unfolding of the large biblical narrative or any part of it down to the individual word read around the person of Christ. Moreover, the same imaginative precision evidenced in Dunn's poetry informs his sermons, where rich and often surprising images draw he hearers into the scriptural story, even as their own stories are illumined by the gospel. Dunn stands in stark contrast with Tillotson, the most acclaimed practitioner of the so-called plain style of preaching which achieved its triumph 30 years after Dunn's death. A fellow of the Royal Society, Tillotson evinced the Society's commitment to clear, unembellished prose, employing the common sense language of moral reason to set forth basic principles of the Christian life, with only passing reference to the story and characters of scripture. Rather than trying to induct his heroes imaginatively into that storied world, as Dunn consistently does, Tillotson remains firmly outside the scriptural narrative as he makes logical arguments for the essential reasonableness of Christianity as over against either atheism or the vicious religious disputes that had generated decades of political instability and violence. Thus, Tillotson helped to effect the shift that Fry describes as the, quote, logical and reflective distance between narrative and reality increased steadily, end quote, and Christians ceased to feel either duty or desire to locate themselves within the richly figured world of scripture. Now, moving out of the 17th century to my own 21st century experience as a scripturally oriented preacher, I often, <clears throat> I often think of my preaching practice as something like elementary language instruction. I slow down over a part of the text and dwell on a word or phrase, testing the literal sense with a view to a particular faith community in the current moment as well as the perennial challenge of being human. Here I note briefly two occasions that raised questions about the validity of preaching the literal sense. The first was some years ago, at Sunday Evensong at Westminster Abbey, three days before the beginning of Lent. The text appointed was Elijah fleeing for his life from Ahab and Jezebel. Immediately after the service concluded, one of the canons approached me with evident dis disapproval. You preached as though Elijah were a real person. This is true. And from his perspective, to tell the story thus without acknowledging the boundary markers established by historical critical scholarship was intellectually irresponsible. I had violated the well-defended border between the story world of the Bible and the world we think we inhabit, as Fry puts it. For this canon, with, I venture to guess, his Oxbridge theological education, no offense, David, the eclipse of the <laughs> biblical narrative was total. But I was preaching to people largely innocent of modern biblical scholarship a motley co congregation of tourists, some few locals, and most significantly, a number of leaders from the Episcopal Church of Sudan. My people live in the Old Testament, Sudanese Bishop, later Archbishop Daniel Dengbol Yak once told me. They need to know their story. I took that as my mandate to make the story plain with its vividly developed characters, God and Elijah to show how the story bears on practicing the presence of God, which is how Mr. Fry identified the basic Christian vocation. And further to demonstrate that in the theologically, to demonstrate that 
in the theologically distinctive season of Lent. I'll end with a second occasion that raised the question of the validity of the literal sense. This past April, I delivered the Devar Tochra, the teaching, the Torah teaching at my neighborhood synagogue on the first Shabbat of Passover, a date that co coincided with Holy Saturday this year. I noted the coincidence and then worked closely with Exodus, the story that both our communities were reading that day and night. I focused on Pharaoh's destructive and self-destructive behavior and what the story might say to us who find ourselves implicated in a vast destructive empire that is, like Pharaoh himself, heedless of human life and ecological cost. I pointed to the fact that fear, both healthy and unhealthy, is a motive force in the Exodus story and asked whether in our time the future of humanity depends on our learning the sane fear of God, Yerathatanai, which is the diametric opposite of pharaonic insanity. I mention this occasion because Hans Frey asserted in his essay, The Literal Reading of Biblical Narrative, that the most urgent issue for Christian interpretation has to do with handling, quote, those parts of a common scripture which Christianity has usurped from Judaism, end quote. And he suggests that the, the, the literal sense has a role to play in repairing the broken relation between the two traditions. I was not thinking of Mr. Fry's essay that Shabbat morning, but I was conscious of the extraordinary hospitality I had been offered in what is historically the most difficult year, week of the year for Jewish Christian relations, when our brokenness has often manifested itself as Christian violence against Jews. I did not address that brokenness in my Torah teaching. Instead, I did what my earliest teachers of Bible, who were all Jews, taught me to do. Stay close to the language of the text. Follow its movement. Think about why it still matters. In Fry's terms, I tested the stretch of the literal sense the most sensitive instrument of practical and public theology for Jews and Christians. Following Fry and likewise the model of Dunn, I trusted that the Exodus story would stretch from Pharaonic Egypt to us who are trapped in the modern transnational empire. I trusted that sense of the story would not break, but rather give us our best hope for speaking some measure of truth in good faith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. And it's wonderful to hear the, the dialogue already developing um, and to have this image of, or this question about what it means now to test the strength of the literal sense and to have already heard Kendall testing it in a different set of ways through these very close readings. Um, so we'll now hand over to, to Drew, um, who's, I don't have a title for your paper, but we have the yes. reading of the That's right. Yes, exactly. And I, it's, um, I'm afraid I've taken the title of this panel, Reading After Fry, completely literally, and I will today be sharing with you a bit about um, the book I first read after completing my research uh, on Fry, which happened to be Willie Jennings' The Christian Imagination. Um, and what I will do is, first I'll describe how I see Jennings' work posing crucial questions back to Fry on the hermeneutical implications of supersessionism, the idea that Christians have replaced Jews as the people of God. And second, I'll inquire about the significance of a practice of Jews and Christians reading scripture together for both Jennings and Fry. So, a bit about Fry first. Um, Fry's first book, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative, shows how the Enlightenment and the rising influence of historicism, empirical philosophy, and deism led conservative and liberal Christians to try and anchor the meaning of scripture in something behind or beyond the text. 
for conservatives, for I saw that the Bible's meaning became reduced to its significance as salvation history. For liberals, its meaningfulness largely became a function of allegory and its internal spiritual import. Though the liberal and conservative defenses of biblical meaning appeared to be very different, Fry demonstrates how conservatives and liberals alike were engaged in an apologetic endeavor, defending the very possibility of scripture's meaningfulness in the face of the critical onslaught. This caused the realistic or history-like element of scripture to be obscured, turning the focus of its interpretation from the biblical narrative itself, the words of scripture, to its purported extra-biblical subject matter or referent. Fry argued that an additional casualty of the loss of the plain sense of scripture was figural reading, which is a way of interpreting the Bible's different history-like narratives, both in relation to one another and in relation to the historical world in which we inhabit. In figural interpretation, the particular figures in scripture are viewed in connection to one another and in connection to people and events in the historical world itself, all in the light of a faith in God's overarching providential dealings with the world, and crucially, all without undermining the particularity and irreducible uniqueness of the different events or persons. As Fry saw it, the eclipse of the plain sense of scripture and the correlated loss of figural interpretation severely limited the possible ways of framing the connection between the scriptural narratives in the Old and New Testament, and also the connection between scripture and the world, and profoundly hobbled Christian theology's capacity to construe the identity of Jesus Christ and the way in which his particular identity might be discerned in God's dealings with Israel and in the world at large. Figural reading for Fry, as John David Dawson describes it, is not a triumphalist retrospective observation of the extent to which one has superseded a past that has rightfully been repudiated. Rather, it is a patient working through the spiritual dynamics of the disciples' movement from his or her state of figure to one of fulfillment, a working forward in the light of the assurances of Christ's first coming, but also of the uncertainties of his not yet realized second coming. This patient working through and working forward in light of the life and death and resurrection and anticipated return of Jesus is a process that extends the significance of the figures in question rather than completely resolving the meaning of the first into the fulfillment of the second. To read Moses in figural connection with Jesus is not to reduce Moses to an anticipation simply of Jesus, whether allegorically or historically framed but to focus our reading on the relation between them held in the trust of God's providence and the consummation of creation that will come with Christ's return. This is also to say, as Peter Oakes has pointed out, that while Fry himself didn't write about supersessionism directly, it is implicitly ruled out by his account of Jesus' identity and of the aptness of figural reading in relation to it. So with that very, very brief recounting of Fry's argument in Eclipse. Let me now turn to Willie Jennings and his exquisite book, The Christian Imagination. The Christian Imagination explores one enormous and essential question for Christians. Quote, why has Christianity, a religion premised upon neighborly love, failed in its attempts to heal social divisions? Jennings traces the answer to the supersessionism prevalent in so much of Christian history with its role in undermining our understanding of who Jesus is, how we are to read scripture in light of his identity, and how we discern the patterns of his presence across history. Jennings shows how the discovery of the new world raised apologetic concerns regarding the comprehensive scope and trustworthiness of scripture's narration of the unfolding of creation, and revealed a new arena for an operationalized Christian supersessionism in the colonial project. As Jennings sees it, Colonialism drew its theological motivation and justification in large part from the European notion that Christians had replaced Israel as God's chosen people, a people encountering strange, new, promised lands. Alongside this came the continued erasure of significance of Jesus' identity as a Jew, an identity that intrinsically involves ties not just to a particular time, but both to a particular place and to a particular community. And as Jennings shows, the supersessionist erasure of the significance of place and people 
from Christian accounts of Jesus' identity was extended to the peoples of the New World and fostered the Christian invention of strict categories of race, which in turn justified European colonialism and yielded the enduring segregation of societies and the fragmentation of peoples. All of this is to say, I think, though he doesn't use the term himself, itself, that much of Jennings' book explores the failure of figural theology under the strictures of supersessionism. Jennings shows how occluding Israel as an enduring place and people of God's covenantal concern, how erasing Israel's role as God's elect and unique mediator of God's universal love, served the colonial repurposing of their own races and European nations in the place of Israel, wherein such mediation quickly became mastery. European Christians, he writes, reconfigured the vision of God's attention and love for Israel. That is, they reconfigured a vision of Israel's election. If Israel had been the visibly elect of God, then that vi visibility in the European imagination migrated without return to a new home shaped by n now new visual markers. If Israel's election had been the compass around which Christian identity gained its bearings and found its trajectory, now, with this reconfiguration, the body of the European would be the compass, marking divine election. Now, no doubt, as has been pointed out by Ellen and, and, and Kendall, Fry, who was a Jew by birth himself, was aware of the problem of supersessionism and its pernicious impact on figural reading and the history of Christian interpretation of scripture. So, again, it is not surprising, as Peter Oakes has convincingly argued, that a basic feature of post-liberal theologies, like Fry's, is, quote, the reaffirmation of classical Christology after modernity is inseparably associated with the rejection of supersessionism. Indeed, Fry's embrace of the plain sense of scripture and the corresponding emphasis on the particularities of Jesus' life and teaching ought to be seen as including the acknowledgement that in the depiction of Jesus in the Gospels, his belonging to the God of Israel and with the people of Israel is an ineradicable and fundamental feature of Jesus' identity. Though it seems perpetually difficult for many Christians to grasp, there is an intrinsic connection between Jesus' membership in the people of Israel, his unsub unsubstitutable identity, and his enduring and universal presence in and with creation. Jesus' Jewishness is not a problem for the promise of his presence, or the promise that creation in all its complex and disparate diversity belongs with the one God. Rather, Jesus' Jewishness is the premise of that promise. But all that said, it is not in Fry's work, but in Willie Jennings, at least for me, that this claim uh, became most clearly and forcefully made. Which leads me to two interrelated questions that we, that we might ask together after, as we uh, read Fry. First, might the problems facing figural, uh, the figural correlation of Jesus' unique identity and presence be rooted not primarily in the logic of the Enlightenment, but in the older and more insidious logic of supersessionism? Jennings' account of the ongoing failure of Christianity to affirm and follow, quote, the central trajectory of the incarnate life of the Son of God, who took on the life of a creature, a life of joining, belonging, connection, and intimacy, as a function of supersessionism, suggests that Fry's Enlightenment-era focus might be too narrow. The Christian intellectual tradition in the New World, Jennings writes, denies its most fundamental starting point, that of the divine word entering, the flesh, entering flesh in time and space to become Jewish flesh. Does Jennings' description of the threats to the literal sense and figural interpretation that arose in relation to supersessionism threats not dissimilar from those more recent ones that Fry focuses on? Do they imply that the appeal to Christ's presence as a mechanism of theological mastery and control has a more ancient pedigree, stemming from the insidious logic of supersessionism itself? Then my second and final question, which I'd like to put to both Jennings and Fry, and to all of you. What is the importance of reading as a communal practice especially as a practice of reading that includes Christians and Jews, for our construal of Jesus' identity, for the figural possibilities of discerning his presence, and for the formation of individuals and communities that bear his likeness. In the years immediately prior to his death at the invitation of Peter Oakes, 
Fry began participating in a seminar with the visiting Jewish Bible scholar Moish Greenberg, the Yale Rabbinic uh, scholar Stephen Frada, and George Limbeck, in which they explored Christian and Jewish perspectives on the literal sense of scripture. This experience is anticipated in an essay that Fry wrote a few years before, which Alan just mentioned, the literal reading of biblical narrative, does it stretch or will it break? In which he suggests, he suggests that Christian reading of scripture might have much to learn from the approach taken by Jewish Midrash. Jennings too, citing Peter Oakes again in the closing pages of the Christian imagination, notes the need for Christians to learn to reread Torah alongside living Israel. But it seems to me that we might need to expand on these brief allusions to the practice of Christian Jewish communal reading of scripture. For if, both for Fry and Jennings, it is important to recognize that according to the gospel portrayals, Jesus, the Son of God, was, is, and will be a Jew, a Jew who has invited Gentiles into the covenant between Israel and God, transforming and extending that covenantal community rather than replacing it. It seems to me that the question of how we go about the practice of Christian and Jews reading each other's scriptures together becomes profoundly important. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Drew. I'm fascinated by this emerging multiplicity of complementary resources for non-supersessionist readings after Fry, and it's going to be great to explore these in more depth as the afternoon continues. Um, we now hand over to David Ford. Um, I don't think yours has a title, Reading After Fry. <laughs> David. Well, it does have a title, actually. And I beg its, its uh, pardon. <coughs> It's, as you predicted, it's something to do with... Sorry, sorry. Leading, sorry. David. So, is that it? <laughs> yes, yes. You got that, okay. Um, you know, as you predicted, uh, Rachel, it has something to do with John's Gospel because I'm really fascinated by how, John, how Fry and John's Gospel go together. Sorry, you got that? Yeah. Stand it on something. I've got a book here oh, to stand it on. It's a wonderful book, this. <laughs> um, and just the right height, yeah. <laughs> among its many virtues. I may mention it. Um, the, um, no, the, the, I, I really am intrigued by, uh, by Fry, Fry and John's Gospel, uh, because, of course, the identity largely is the synoptics, and uh, within the synoptics is largely Luke's Gospel. And, uh, and I'm intrigued by how, how does Fry relate to the Gospel of John? Um, and so my title is Reading with Fry and with Others After Fry, What About the Gospel of John? <laughs> and, and um, I mean, I go back to that course that I, I mentioned uh, from Locke to Pannenberg in, in my sermon this morning, uh, where, uh, you know, Hans and I were doing it one-to-one, -one and we stopped with Bart. You know, we never got beyond Bart. But, but the really crucial thing, I think, to, in Fry on Bart was that he started me off not on 1-1. One, one. You know, I'd come from Cambridge where we hadn't read Bart in those days. Uh, the, um, uh, it, but we started with volume four of the Church Dogmatics, and uh, that was extraordinarily important. And when, uh, about after 19 years working on my commentary on the Gospel of John, I eventually came to an insight about what its basic dynamic structure is. That, that um, the, uh, it, it, which, which was that it's got a horizon of God and all reality. It's got the drama of Jesus all through, and it's got interwoven with that the, dra the ongoing drama of discipleship. And that all of those, and of course the, the key moment of transition to, from one to the other uh, is the, um, the giving of the Holy Spirit, um, which is not irrelevant to things David Kelsey was saying this afternoon as well. I'd love to go into those in detail. But, the, um, but lo and behold, having come to that insight uh, a few years ago, um, when I thought back to reading volume four with, with Hans of, of the church dogmatics, you know, that, that Bart again and again in four one, in four two, in four three, doing the identity of Jesus Christ first. Then you have your soteriology. So so then you have your ongoing discipleship, so to speak. Um, and that the, and I, I, I do really think that uh, what I learned from Hans during that eventually uh, was the, 
um, you know, the, the, the way in which Bart, the later Bart especially, is so deeply Johannine. I think he, he, he matured it. You know, if you think of the, the very earliest Bart as Romans, you know, that by the time he reached 4.3, that ex was extraordinarily daring uh, theology in, in 4.3. Uh, and I'm encouraged by seeing George Hunsinger nodding here in front of me. That... <laughs> 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 You know, you know, he, he really did, he, he was just utterly steeped and speaking out, I think, of a, of a mature, but which, which of course goes with my understanding of the Gospel of John as the most matured of the Gospels, so to speak, you know, and one that is steeped in the synoptics as well. Now, I have to really watch my time, don't I, Rachel? Um, the, the, um, so, my question, my fundamental question, th this, by the way, is not nearly a, a mature paper like the others. I have not got to the point of writing my paper. I mean, these people who do that, I just am full of admiration. But, but, uh, but mine has yet to be done, and this is really a set of questions about Bart and John, because I want to try to ask about the identity of Jesus Christ, how this is. And I think it is, it, there's an awful lot of other uh, questions that arise out of this as well. Um, and I, I've conducted an extreme, of a continuum, of a, a, an extreme in which, on the one hand, the Johannine question about Fry's identity of Jesus Christ, which we heard so wonderfully from, from David this afternoon, um, is, is um, it, that it is richly, deeply Johannine. Uh, the, the, uh, the identity of Jesus Christ, that, it, that once you look at it, really, all that he says about Luke is really fulfilled in a, in a good understanding of John's gospel. Now, that's one extreme. The other extreme is that uh, he lost his Johannine nerve somewhere or other. That, you know, I, I mean, I have this fantasy that Wayne Meeks, his colleague, you know, who has what I have come to think of is not a good interpretation of John as a sectarian gospel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that there's a huge debate about that, of course. But um, that that uh, and Fry was quite close to Main Meeks, actually, uh, and um, that that somehow he he was intimidated by the downgrading of John by people who say earliest is best, by people who say this is more historically, you know, etc. And I think uh, that that is a profound mistake to go that way. And I just wonder whether Fry's concentration on the Luke and the synoptics rather than on John, which seems to be to match his theology so much better. You can see which extreme I'm at, can't you? Um, <laughs> that, that, um, that, uh, that, that Fry, Fry just wobbled a bit where, where, when it came to affirming John, and yet I think that his, his own theology, when you, when you look at it, and I've been trying to reread uh, several times the identity in order to come to a conclusion on this, but, but, uh, but it, we'll see what happens as, as I go on with it. Um, I would just love to, I have a whole set of questions for David Kelsey in relation to David Kelsey's here that were generated by that wonderful paper this afternoon on the, on the identity. And really, they all conclude that really, in the end of the day, one extreme is right, you know, that it is the extreme that Fry was deeply Johannine, and that we're wrong to ignore that, and that, uh, you know, that one thing after another, you know, that, that, the, that the relationship to God is primary. Who emphasizes the relationship of the Father and the Son more than John's Gospel? Absolutely singular identity. I am. It's identity, and I'm going to ask Kendall about this too. The identity is there in the eye. That's not a that's not a playing down of the of, of the pre, you know a, a presence domination. The the eye is there, uh, there, and it's, of course it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, but uh, but one thing after you know that, that soteriology must not, must be regulated by Jesus's person. John's gospel hits soteriology. As the Father sent me, so I send you. You know that that it is. You know that that the whole of Christian salvation work is about re getting deeper into the identity of who Jesus is, and then uh, having an analogical imagination in order to fill out that capacious as as the Father sent me, so I send you, um, and so on. Rachel, have I run out of time? You can have a couple more minutes, oh, thank David. You very, <laughs> thank you very nice. much indeed. <laughs> Look, I, I'll, I'll come to, I, I, I mentioned this morning in the sermon about 
those walks I had with Hans during the three weeks in which, in 1987, when he was giving his Cadbury lectures, he, he lived with, uh, with our little household in, 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 with our little household in, in Birmingham. And I remember I was into Levinas and Derrida at the time, I confess. <laughs> um, I mean, they're very different, and I'm still into Levinas, but not so much into Derrida still. Um, but, but I remember Hans just, you know, he, he had such a gentle way of doing this, but my goodness, it was devastating. Um, you know, he started reflecting on, yes, when you get into these high culture philosophical discourses, you know, that there is a question about how it relates to ordinary Christians and how theology should relate to ordinary Christians. And he, he his way of posing the question just made me think, yeah, it's not that you don't read Levinas and you don't read Der Derrida, but that actually at the end of the day you do have to connect with ordinary Christians and ordinary discourses and that. Now, it's ironic because Hans very rarely <laughs> did. Let's face it, he's extraordinarily <laughs> difficult to understand. But when I, when I came to the crisis in my... Uh, I, I retired from my chair in Cambridge in 2015. And I'd given the Oxford Bampton lectures the previous year, uh, earlier that year, actually, and came out of that and... I nearly finished, Rachel. <laughs> the, the, and ca came out of that, in, in, that had to be academic, you know, in Oxford. Um, and um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, and I, I reread all I'd written in the previous 15 years of working on the Gospel, on the Gospel of John. And I realized it just wouldn't do. It fell between stools. That on the one hand, I was engaging in all these fascinating academic debates. And on the other hand, I was trying to speak to the church and even people beyond the church. And I wanted it to be in line with what Hans said, that it had to be in line with ordinary Christians. So I simply scrapped everything that I'd written and started again, tried it out on my wife, who is extraordinarily honest with me, and, uh, and with my poet friend, Michal Ushil. And, and, um, and when they said it was, it was uh, you know, they thought you had an accessible style. But I just thought back to that thing that Hans had. He, he had this gift of somehow going to the heart of your vocation. And I think that what he had said there was that my vocation wasn't writing large tomes on Levinas and Derrida. Uh, I tried to write a little on, on, on Levinas. But, but that it was, well, writing what I've tried to write, the, gospel, the commentary on John. Thanks, Rachel, for being so patient. <laughs> Enormous thanks once again to all of our panel. Um, I'd like to, since we've already heard lots of chimes and echoes between them, I was thinking here even about the, the relationship between what David's saying about um, a, 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 a need to address um, ordinary Christians and, and, and Ellen's experience of the testing of the literal sense in preaching. Um, so at this point, I'd, I'd like to invite panelists, if they wish to, respond to or comment on each other's papers. We, we won't have time to do any of that in great detail, but basically I'm giving the panelists first, first shot um, at questions and responses, and then I'm going to turn it over to the, to the audience. Um, don't know if anyone, David wants a <laughs> the second go, that's cheating. <laughs> it's this book, it's this book, which is called The Johannine Renaissance in Early Modern English Literature and Theology. And it's a beautiful book by the American scholar, Paul Cephalou. Um, and, and your question. And the question <laughs> is, to El, is to Ellen, because he has wonderful treatments of John Donne in this, and then, uh, but doesn't, of course, go up as far as Tillotson. And, you know, what was happening there? And my, my question is whether there's a much bigger issue here, uh, which goes something like this. I, I think of Stephen Toulman's book, Cosmopolis, on the way in which the Renaissance was squished by the Enlightenment. And that what it seems to me was going on here, and John's Gospel, therefore, for me, is part of this, and this lovely thing about, about how post all those terrible battles of the uh, Reformation, bloodlettings, you know, and so forth, 
that the uh, th that John's gospel was the gospel many of them turned to. You know, uh, George Herbert, Dunn, and so forth. You know, they're deep, deep into, uh, among other things, of course. Um, and so, you know, is there just a much bigger picture of the way the Renaissance and its thousand flowers blooming, as Stephen Toulmin described it, was squished by? That, you know, by, by a certain, a whole other, era, you know, intellectual era that was, uh, you know, the 18th century Enlightenment. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Maybe. Uh. Um, I mean, I truly have no notion of that, but I can see that, oh, sorry, um, Dunn is so word-oriented. He's, I mean, he, he thought, having had a scurrilous life, his, he understood it. He understood that he was called to ordained ministry because he was a poet, and the Holy Spirit is a poet. And that's what he had to offer. And so that's what he expected to be remembered by his sermons, not his poems. Um, and so I cannot speak to the larger movements in European thought, but I, it does seem to me that Dunn is orienting, and this is, I think, part of what attracts him about the Gospel of John, as about the Psalms, that the rich imagery of it, I mean, the amount of time that he will spend on light, <laughs> um, and, um, and preaching in a murky, a murky December solstice in London and just bringing all of us into that moment in John's gospel when the light enters this world. There's something very, um, there's something of the medieval pageant in the way Dunn preaches, it seems to me. I mean, he was, you know, he, he knew he was the best show in London. I mean, he did, you know. Um, and uh, very, very different from Tillotson. I mean, Dunn had, I think, a much bigger ego, than, actually. Um, but uh, so I think that he brings that sense of pageantry, and also, but what ignites it for him is the individual words of Scripture. And, and one other thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. Um, something that fascinated me was to learn that in Dunn's time, Hebrew was more studied than Greek, at Oxford at least. I find that very interesting. And he will cite much more Hebrew than he does Greek. Um, it, there's something about the, the language that fascinates him and probably the different ways that it can move. There is something very, he's not give, doing a philological analysis of it. He's doing a poetic riff on it. And I must say, as you were speaking, I think it was, was your comment, Drew, that I found myself thinking about Jews and Christians studying scripture together. And I think one of the most important things that can happen in a Christian divinity school is to make people feel really crummy if they don't study Hebrew. Um, and we've done a pretty good job of that at Duke Divinity School. Um, and because it changes, it changes the game. And Jews simply don't regard a translation of the Bible as serious. Duke Divinity School, we've done a really good job of making people feel crummy if they don't study Hebrew. This is the, new, come. <laughs> this is the new advertising slogan. 
I don't know, Drew, did you, did you want to, to comment further on, on that? Or on, on <laughs> I don't know. I don't know on that, but I, I, well, I've got a question of my own, actually, um, for, for, um, well, for everybody, but it's sort of inspired by, um, Ellen, something that you were, the, the, the distinction you were drawing out between um, Dunn and Tillotson, and, 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 um, and David, also your comments about um, reaching beyond the academy, the importance of speaking beyond the, 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 the confines of the, the cultured um, elites, um, which is, Fry's often mischaracterized as a fideist. Um, he is described as somebody, you know, because of his rejection of uh, sort of systematic apologetic approaches to the interpretation of scripture, often the opposite is assumed of him um, by some people who should know better and who say, well, that just means he doesn't care at all about the plausibility. Um, what I heard from what you were describing, and similarly from his comments to you, is that, especially in the context of preaching, um, plausibility is not something you can uh, dispense with. Of course, to some extent, making the text plausible to your listeners and its import on them is paramount, of paramount sorts, but it's a different sort of construal of what is plausible or what, you know. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you understood the sort of ad hoc apologetics um, that come from preaching like Fry would have you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Imagining how Fry must have preached, but we don't have evidence of it. Well, more how, yes, question? more, <laughs> more how, how um, in, there is a sort of implicit uh, affirmation of plausibility in your stream, but that's the different from the kind that Tillotson modeled on. So how do you right, understand right, the sort okay. of task of making well, scripture plausible? Doesn't he, doesn't he say at one point that if one preaches the literal sense, the the truth question won't take care of itself, something to that effect. Um, as I say, I don't try, I don't really worry about plausibility. Um, I worry about intelligibility, which I think is a different question. And that's why I say that I often think of myself as a preacher, as an elementary language teacher, and of course I teach elementary Hebrew. Um, and I just try to help people get inside the language and reckon with a few words and see how they're being used, which is, again, very much the way Dunn will preach. You know, because thou hast been my help, therefore under the shadow of thy wings will I re rejoice. Wings. Wings mean something different in Isaiah than it does in Psalms, and Dunn will just spend a long time on wings, you know, and showing you the different things. He's not, he's really not trying to persuade us of something in a sense, as I see it. He's trying to open something up for us, trusting that it will, the plausibility, the truth question will take care of itself. It seems to me the least plausible approach is to do a sort of historical critical ana analysis of a text. I mean, I remember, I was at Christ Church, Oxford. Um, yeah, for my sins. Um, and it was New Year's Eve, and the preacher began with a fine, I mean, a, a well-known theologian. Um, began with telling us about the um, some kind of a fine historical distinction about the source of the text. <laughs> Give it a rest. It's New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so appalled. Um, and at the door, he said to me, Perhaps I misspoke in the early minutes. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I was just looking so appalled. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that persuades no one of anything. Kendall, I wanted, to, I wondered if you had any um, comments, maybe particularly on, in relation to David's paper and the, the, the names of God 
question in, in, in John, but, or, or maybe on any of the other. Um. Uh, well, um, thanks for the invitation. I, just briefly, uh, um, David, so I, I am, you know, I think is a wonderfully pregnant phrase. The thing about that particular phrase, though, is that Popeye can say it too. I am who I am. And so it's, it's, it's in itself uh, both an emphatic statement of identity, but the identity is not as ambiguous. So, um, and that's one of the points that Aquinas makes about that's why that's such an appropriate name for God, because in a certain way of looking at it, it's the broadest and least specified name. So if it's read according to its surface meaning only, then it actually doesn't specify identity. And that's why I think it's very important to read it against the texture of the gospel as a whole, where it's clear that the fourth gospel is using oblique language for the divine name in a highly conscious, multiform way, of which I am is one formulation. Uh, but he's also expressly talking about your name that you have given me. In John 17, he has the formula, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord at the beginning of the uh, gospel in order to tell us how to read that phrase later on. So in that context, it's not a, a unspecific specifier. It's, it's yeah. itself an oblique reference to a name that's not being spoken. Could you just give, I love your interpretation of John 17, 26, uh, where, you know, you know the name, what, what is the name? Just, just give, us, give us a bit on John 17, 26, please. <laughs> Well, I mean, John 17, the high priestly prayer, begins and ends with references to the divine name. And Jesus is on, there's only one conversation between Jesus and the first person in the entire New Testament. Um, and that's earlier when Jesus says, Father, uh, glorify your name. And the Father replies, I have glorified it and I will glorify it. That's the only conversation. It's the only two-sided remark. It's about the divine name. Uh, the divine name is not Father. Um, the divine name is, as John says, as Jesus says in John 17, is your name that you have given me. And that's the name in which Jesus has come. It's the name that he's glorified. And um, it's the same name, blessed is the one who comes in the name of Lord. I mean, there's no mystery about what this name is. It's the name of the burning bush. It's the name of John 3, 50, of Exodus 3. 50. There's no mystery. It's just that, of course, being Jews, they don't say the name. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> um, friends, we have some time for um, questions and comments and responses from the audience, which might be to the panel in general or to, to, spe to specific members. So, um, oh, someone's getting in first. Please, um, please do wait for the microphone so we can hear you, and please hold it close to your mouth. My name is Richard Burnett. I was class of '83, uh, and this was my dining hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, f I want to acknowledge, first of all, um, what a spirit uh, Hans Frey was when he came up the hill. Uh, I don't think he taught any classes here at the Divinity School when I was here. I think he was downtown all the time. I may be wrong about that. I may have been ducking his classes, but I hope not. But a lot of the professors that I really esteemed and, I mean, really were frightened of in some ways, but really esteemed, loved Hans Frey. So I want to talk about reading Hans Frey after reading Hans Frey. <laughs> when I mean reading, I mean understanding. Re I read you. I, I get you. And we've talked about his... his uh, his uh, Jewish identity, his Jewish childhood, which from all his biographical things, says it was pretty secular and pretty non-observant. And he went to a Lutheran, maybe you all know this, but he went to a Lutheran school that if the children weren't baptized, this is in Germany, if the children weren't baptized by the time they were seven, they just pushed off and were baptized. So any sense of of choice in the baptismal moment or believer's baptism or anything for, you know, of age wasn't the case. And then he went to a British Quaker school where he was very unhappy. But there's a marvelous story about him seeing a portrait of 
Jesus, and he just knew that this was true. I mean, if that doesn't preach, I don't know what does. I knew it was true. So all of what we're reading is about that. Could you say something about his continuation with this society of friends? Um, as an Episcopal priest, continuing and finding a nurturance in his adulthood and even up to his untimely death with the Quakers. Anyone up for that? I mean, could I just suggest, uh, Rachel, that you speak to Hans the Quaker? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can do that. I, I've, I've, well, so uh, I, 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 I was going to say in my, in my plenary at the, this evening, but I'll get, in, I'll get in early so it'll save time this evening, was the, the thing that I realised literally this morning, chatting to, to, to George Hunsinger at breakfast, was that I kind of do know Hans Fry because growing up Quaker in England, um, just around all the time as actually quite significant presences in my life, were people all about the same age with German names and Jewish backgrounds because, because there, were, there were lots of folks that, 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 that have this kind of journey um, and um, we've still got a few of them left which is amazing um, so there's the yeah I mean the, 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 there was something quite distinctive there is something quite distinctive there's something um, about the, 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 the passion the, 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 the political and religious passion um, for justice that I've found in in, in, in folks that went through that experience, not wanting to generalise, um, that I actually heard a bit of in David's sermon this morning as well, with about the, 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 the sorts of conversations that the one would would have. But I'd like to, I don't know, I'd, 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 I'd want those who knew the man himself better to say something more about what, what the <laughs> what the Quakers gave him, other than a bad school experience. Um, uh, but maybe, okay, no, I, 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 I do think there's something very interesting about the, uh, the, 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 the struggling with how to engage and overcome um, points of conflict and neuralgic points and the identification of, like, like was actually picked up in all of these papers, right? Um, that, that, that here is, here is, here between Christian, here's the concern between Christians and Jews, for example, right? So, so actually here we need to, we need to try and do some work, but we don't yet know how. There's something significant there. But sorry, I'm, I'm going to shut up because I don't think it's, uh, I, I didn't prepare the paper, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to say anything more on this, or maybe we have another question from the, or comment from the audience. Oh. Here. Um. Thank you. Um, David, please. Um, and that could go to Drew or anyone else. What, is, what exactly, at least from your own reading, does it mean to, for a theologian to attend not only to academics, but to ordinary Christians? What, because for me, the context of a Christian community, the majority of whom don't have theology degrees, are really, is really, really important. But what does that mean is, was Fry only interested in what we might call, at least what I call it in my most recent book, an explanatory model. Academic theologians simply explain something in ordinary language, accessible language to theologians, or does it mean what I also call a different genre, which I call constitutive, in other words, engaging the community itself and discerning theological materials that the community generates? Would you please? I, I'm glad you raised that. I have a very uh, poignant memory. I, I think my first acquaintance with Hans was when I took a seminar as an undergraduate, and I think I was probably a sophomore or junior. And there were seven or eight of us in the class, and it was on Bart, Boltmann, and Tillich. 
And in the course of that, that's also when I heard David Kelsey's name for the first time, because Fry would talk about Kelsey in connection with Tillich. But it was a small class, and of course we were reading very difficult texts, and, uh, but I remember that Fry would refer uh, on more than one occasion to the fact that here at Yale University, there were small groups of students who gathered together and were reading the Bible together. And uh, he spoke of it, you know, with, um, with this kind of, um, like, he wasn't sure he could let us know that this was actually <laughs> happening on campus and, and, uh, and whether we'd, we'd run out screaming or something like that. Um, <laughs> but, but it was clear, and of course, we were ourselves, most of us, participating in groups like that, so it was no big secret. But um, it, from his perspective, there was something um, exotic and deep, well, exotic, the, from his position as a, as a master of a college and teaching a seminar, there was a sense of exoticism about that. But it was also clear that it was something that he deeply cared about and treasured. And that tension between being the academician and being someone whose deepest concern was actually the small groups of students who were reading the Bible, I think was part of you know, the peculiar tension of being Hans Frey. Well, yes, I mean, uh, I, I think conversation is my answer, you know, in all directions is my answer to that. You know, you know when I think of the intensive conversations year after year that have been able to go on, you know, both in my parish, you know, with, with students, with uh, you know, interfaith ones in scriptural reasoning have been extraordinarily uh, important. And just the last few days, I've been up in Salisbury, Connecticut, at uh, the uh, house belonging to my wife and her siblings uh, on a lake there. Uh, but our vicar from, uh, from Cambridge, who, who, who had a wonderful time with Ellen in Duke recently on sabbatical and came back all fired up about, uh, the, <laughs> about so many things, actually, Ellen, thank you. Uh, but, but she has decided to have a, a year on John in our, in our parish. Guess why? <laughs> and, and the, the, but but it, was, it was so fascinating to try to set up exactly this sort of, you know, a multi-level thing for a very complex parish, you know, with, with all sorts of people in it, you know, that could somehow bring people into conversation around this extraordinarily de rich text, you know, which is actually written in amazingly simple Greek, you know, as, as anybody who's begun to learn Greek through it, you know, knows that, that this is the, the sim simple Greek. And, um, and I, I, I think, I mean, Hans's thing about levels, you know, that, that, that uh, it's not just levels in terms of academic levels that, you know, but, but, you know, in those conversations, you really often go deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, that, that, that there's no, uh, you know, it's not about social class or it's not about academic expertise, that, that um, it has been the most extraordinary thing I, I found. Uh, you know, just with that one text of John, having those intensive conversations. Looking for other questions. Um, so I think we've got, we've got one here, please. Um. So this is a question for David and then a yes or no um, response from the other panelists. David, a couple of years ago at a conference in London on generous orthodoxy, you said that you reckoned that Hans Frey was the 20th century theologian who had the most to teach us in the 21st century, at least Anglo-American theologian. And I'd like you, you, but you, I don't recall you giving an answer to that question. It was posed as a statement. Maybe you could explicate that briefly, and I'd be curious to know whether the other panelists agree or disagree. <laughs> well, very, very briefly, I mean, I think Hans's three great contributions are all generative for the 21st century, potentially. You know, his eclipse of biblical narrative and that discernment of what was going on over those centuries and, uh, and the, the conclusions he came to in the eclipse, the identity of Jesus Christ as the basis of dogmatic theology, you know, that, that um, I, I think that still needs to be received. It, it hasn't been received very thoroughly yet at all and, and deserves it. 
uh, and then the types of Christian theology, uh, which, um, you know, for me, I, you know, I, I think are, are an extraordinarily profound way of typing, much better than any of the other categories around. I mean, just let's not have liberal, conservative, radical, and things like that. When you've got Hans's five types, you've got a way of really understanding something of the dynamics of, 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 of theology in a way that, as Drew shows, can extend to all sorts of other things as well. You know, and, and really, I think the beginning, you know, it's only begun the reception of that typology as well. Do, do any of the others want to comment? Can no. You? Okay, that's fine. No, you don't want to comment on that. No, no, you don't think no. so. <laughs> I was taking up the invitation to say yes or no to the question. And, oh. and, 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 I, and I, as much as I love Hans Frey and as deeply as he impressed himself on my life, I would have to say no. We were going to ask you in the break what, who your alternative candidates are, but I'm <laughs> going to see if any of the others want to chip in. I, I, I can just say, for me personally, that is in the, the case. For my own reading of Christian theology and faith in the 21st century, without a doubt, Fry has been the most significant figure and somebody who I still continue. In preparation for this conference, I went back and was reading lots of his essays, and I was troubled to find out how much I still had to struggle through them <laughs> to make sense, and I thought I had figured them all out, and then I had to go right back again and put all the pieces together again, and which revealed new insights. Um, so I, I, I absolutely find myself still learning from them, and it's changed, it's changed the course of my career, and yeah, absolutely. I'm not qualified to answer it because I spent four years in a doctoral program here and never understood anything Hans Frey wrote um, until maybe eight months ago. Um, and he was on my dissertation committee, um, but dissertation committees were formed, at least in my experience, by your director. And so now I understand why Bard Childs put him on my committee. And I realized that I learned a great deal from him indirectly um, through sort of the water here, even though I didn't understand what he wrote. Um, but I would say that for someone who has practical theology concerns, as I do, he's very, very helpful. And is there a question? That, yes, please. <clears throat> this is a sort of Johannine question, so again to David, but then to the other panelists. Um, and, it's, and, and, and I have a speculative addendum, but I'll just begin with the question. So, as we heard this morning from David Kelsey, Fry had second thoughts about presence, which he puts in the preface to the book. So also he had second thoughts about narrative. So almost as soon as people grabbed the narrative theology idea in the mid-late 70s, he started to run from it. And, and so here's the Johannine connection, David. I'm just wondering if, if you have narrative, say synoptic narrative, without that Johannine incarnational moment, then narrative turns into either of the things he disliked, either a kind of flattened salvation history or my story, <laughs> which he, he didn't want theology to become autobiographical in that way. So you needed that Johannine element, and I think you're right. I think it's there in the text of identity it's wanting to come out. I don't know whether it's um, Wayne Meeks's fault or, or what, but um, yeah. So my, then the speculative addendum, and it goes back to that story, uh, the famous story about the painting at the Quaker school. That would seem to me a good candidate for a, th a Christology of manifestation, which would be a Johannine Christology. I don't know. I mean, just, just, just one thought, uh, you know, on, on the Johannine narrative and the synoptic, I was so intrigued in David Kelsey's one today. It struck me for the first time that actually the t first two transitions that he talked about aren't there in John. There's no account of the baptism of Jesus. There's a reference to it. There's no account of the temptations in John. And there's no account of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is distributed between chapters 11, 12, and 13 in John, I think. And, uh, and it's, it's quite fascinating that, therefore, all the emphasis is on the other transition into the resurrection. 
No. And of course, he has more on the resurrection, you know, than any of the other gospels. So, so uh, you know, in a sense, that's I think, again, making the point about how Johannine Fry is that uh, the big thing he emphasised is the one transition that Fry made most known narratively. We have time for one or two more questions. If I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've seen I've seen two. I think one here, one here. So can, maybe, can we maybe hear them both and then then get panel responses? Would that be all right? Thanks very much. I, I want to say, um, Ellen, I, I now feel very guilty never having taken Hebrew or <laughs> or Greek. <laughs> you, you accomplished your goal. Yeah, I was. I used to be very smug about that. And, uh, now I now I feel really bad. So <laughs> so mission accomplished. <laughs> um, but uh, my question is for Drew. Um, you had said you know for Jennings in the Christian imagination, and then also I think this was the case very much for Fry that uh, this this enduring problem. I think this is generally a post-liberal problem. The, the problem of having a meaning in the text other than the text itself is going to distort your sense of the text. Um, I'm concerned about this repeated, you know, sense of identity as this central thing for Fry, uh, that this is supposed to be the thing that's going to secure our Christology, secure our Christianity. Uh, but um, it seems to me that, you know, for instance, like the, that, at the end of the 20th chapter of John, to say, well, the purpose of this book is, yeah, you need to know that Jesus is the son of the living God, but also the purpose of that is so that you might have life in his name forever. Since the, the purposiveness of it is the relationship of Fry to us salvifically, you know? Like for me, it seems that it's not anthropocentric to say, you know, Christology is God for us. And maybe he does. So I guess maybe I'm just sort of weighing out a concern for Jennings, for Fry. Um, is it possible to say, yes, there really can be a meaning in the text, or that's not what Fry's getting at, to deny that that's the purpose of it? You know, that's, I guess I'm sort of concerned that for Fry, soteriology would be removed from the, the human condition. It would just be self-reflexive and so on, and maybe you can talk me down from that or something like that. <laughs> can, we, can we hear, just, just, to make sure we get, just to make sure we get the questions in. If... Yeah, thanks very much all. I'm, I'm puzzling about, well, David, your relation, relating of John to the other um, Gospels, and actually perhaps the rest of the Bible, in terms of maturation. Um, I'm worried about that language. Um, partly because it, it sort of moves a little bit too much towards progress for me. Um, and Fry's language of figuration doesn't do that at all. Um, and so if we think back to the questions about supersessionism and his, um, all those concerns, how does your language of maturation um, not go into that troubling territory? Great. So, Drew, do you want to say something in relation to the first question? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm, unfortunately, I, I think I missed a few words there. But if the question was, uh, was it... Um, the idea that there is uh, uh, Fry's avoiding a sense of meaning in the text is that we so I don't think that's actually what he says and I misspoke I think if you, if you heard that what I, what I think he is saying is that having a prior account of the plausibility of the meaningfulness of the text so as to say uh, this text is reliable insofar as it is a history and therefore we can or this text is reliable insofar as it describes something internal to the human that and that is how we can understand construe its meaningfulness writ large. Um, and so those sort of theological prolegomena uh, that anchor the, the, the text meaning in a certain framework, um, he, 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 he discourages us from, a, from adopting. So it is not a case that there's meaning in the text itself, although I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he would say about the meaning of the scripture, I mean, other than it might be an account of who Jesus is and who, who we are in that light. It's interesting that the, the, there was the reference to the double, the double, these things were written so that you might know and so that you might have life. And that, yeah. I took it, that was, that was also part of, the, yes. part of the question, right? Does identity actually sum up the whole of the texts so that? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. David, did you want to say something about maturation and progress? Yeah, I mean, progress is not the only way you can talk about maturation. I, I don't see it at all. You know, you also die. You know, that, that, that um, the, you know, you know but, 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 but what, what I do think is there can be deepening. You know, you know I mean, depth is one of the key metaphors, you know, I, it, it, that, that I, I tend to use. But, but it is because I think what was happening in the Johannine, uh, you know, in, in John, is that there, there was quite a long time, you know, the, the rumors about him still being around, 
you know, the fake news in the community you know, <laughs> was, is there. That, that, you know, he obviously lived a long time. And, and, and what can happen for some of us as we grow older <laughs> is that we can deepen and mature and take more things into account. You know, all those books that were written, that were being written, you know, the, the earlier ones didn't have the advantage of all the other writings, all the other testimonies. I think John makes perfectly clear in both endings, in chapters 20 and 21, there were a lot of other books around, you know, a lot of other things around. And, and therefore, I, I think, you know, and, and I think, you know, th there's things like all the expectation of the end, you know, that the Johannine way of dealing that is so exquisite, isn't it? It's, it's a, you know, what is it to you if he should abide until I come? In other words, the Johannine eschatology is the future, yeah, it's Jesus, but now get on and follow me. You know, you know that, that in other words, none of the spectaculars of Mark 13 and so forth. Now, it's not denying any of that, but it's saying, you know, after, after many years in which this hasn't happened, you know, maybe, you know, one should uh, just ha have that, well, I still call it Johannine maturity. <laughs> <laughs> wondered if, um, as we draw to a close, whether any of the other panellists wish to comment either on, 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 on these questions or on other points they haven't had the chance to speak on. Um, this is a... It's a bit of space if anybody's got a final word. Um, I think, did David, do you want something, something you wanted to add in? Well, <laughs> just, just about friendship. You know, that, that my sense being here in what I was saying this to David Kelsey just, just earlier, that, you know, that I, I took courses with Hans, with David, and with George Lindbeck. And one of the things that one just thought, felt at the end of it was that there was a set of friends here, that they, they were in deep conversation with each other in various ways. They respected each other and so forth. And I am just absolutely intrigued at how those intensive conversations around texts is one of, uh, one of the main ways you can generate friendships as well. I mean, for me, it's happened through scriptural reasoning, uh, you know, that, that many of my really close friends. You know, I, I just think of three weeks reading John 8 with Peter Oakes when he was living with us in Cambridge, <laughs> that, uh, giving lectures, you know, and, and what it means to, to read that sort of a text, you know, with a, with a Jew. Friends, um, thank you for your um, attention, for your wonderful questions. Let's thank our panel.